You're listening to the Be Chic University podcast, and I am your host, Brittany Ball. On this show, we discuss all things millennial, but some of my favorite topics are money advice, career moves, productivity hacks, and managing a side hustle from five to nine when you have a nine to five. Catch these golden nuggets on the Be Chic University podcast as we dig into the millennial lifestyle with a hint of professional chic advice from yours truly. Tune in weekly for fresh content and check out my blog 24-7 for even more at bcu.org. Now, let's get into the episode. Hello, beautiful people. So we are back with another episode of the Be Chic University podcast. Today, we are continuing the series on purchasing a home, your first home at that. Nick and I are going into the last week of our first month in our new home. And we're learning so much from hiring a handyman to assist with things we couldn't quite get right to repainting our first room. It has surely been an adventure. And I might give you some stories about all the craziness we've been through in the coming episodes. But today I thought it would be great to give you a quick or not so quick rundown of the complete process we went through in purchasing our home. So this podcast will be a little bit longer than our normal podcast, but it's still not extremely long. It's not like an hour, as you can see. So typically the home closing process is 30 days, but our search started months before that as we lined up credit expectations and our budget before even submitting the loan application. So I remember early in the process being anxious to jump to the next step because I knew what to expect. And after studying for my real estate license, I had a pretty good handle on the process. Well, theoretically, whereas my husband was new to it all. So I constantly explained things to him to fill in the gaps where we would have gone to our agent for assistance. And speaking of my knowledge in real estate, I have been tirelessly studying for my license exam and I know I mentioned this on last week's episode that I would actually be taking my exam on Saturday but I postponed the test by a week to um, build up my confidence in the content so please keep me in mind send your prayers good vibes um, good thoughts all of that as I take the next big step finally in establishing my real estate career you know I do not believe in taking um, all the attempts they give you three attempts I just want to do one and done and so I just really want to make sure I get this right so just keep that in mind hopefully next week Monday I will have another update for you hopefully stating that I got my license so back to what we were talking about for this episode Um, although I will be discussing our unique process I will be incorporating some advice for you to take if you are in the process of buying your first home, just so that you can get an idea of what the timeline could look like, especially during this new world that we're living in. Um, So I'm warning you now, take out your notes, pull out the app in your phone, take out your notebook, whatever you need to do to catch the different things that I talk about in this episode because I really do believe it'll be a handy resource moving forward. And if you don't want to take notes, download this episode, bookmark it, share it, whatever you need to do so that you have it handy. So without further ado, let's jump into our five-month home buying timeline. So I consider this the pre-offer stage Uh, before we reached out to our agent who was even going to help us buy the home. I knew we had to get on the same page on a few things before we got the questions from her in our like onboarding process for being our agent. So Nick and I answered a few questions for ourselves. Where do we want to live close to his job, my job or in between? And we actually settled on in between just because commuting in the DFW is so crazy. Many people commute really far to get to work. And so we decided that we wanted to make it kind of even between us in our ability to drive to work in a not so um, cluttered 
route. So we both kind of have like a 30 minute drive to work depending on traffic. And then we also talked about the must have items that we wanted in our home so that we can narrow down our search. So we knew for sure we wanted an updated kitchen, updated bathroom, two floors, uh, three bedrooms minimum, and preferably an extra space dedicated to gaming. And there were a few more ones, but we wanted to stick to those things as far as deal breakers. And then lastly, we talked about what type of mortgage payment we could afford and how we wanted to split up the bills with the mortgage and additional utilities and just all the things that come along with home ownership since that's currently our approach to shared finances is splitting up the bills. So having those things kind of answered for ourselves made it easier for when we met with our agent for the first time. Once we had that all figured out, we knew we were on the same page. So we prepared for our first meeting with the realtor. So our next step, obviously, was reaching out to our realtor who will represent us as buyer's agents. And you may not know, but you don't necessarily need a buyer's agent in the United States. You can represent yourself, but having an agent gives you someone who is an expert in the industry who can advocate for you and no one else. Someone who is totally dedicated to you having what you want and deserve at the end of the process and not being taken advantage of, which is what was happening prior to the 1980s. Buyers were being taken advantage of, although sellers were historically always represented by a realtor, but the buyers were not. So like any other people nowadays looking for a home, we sought out an agent and she was there to guide us through the entire process. I think I mentioned this before, but we started the process in early May and I reached out to Siobhan Carolina of Aim Higher Realty, who I actually found on Instagram. So I love finding new businesses, especially black businesses to support on Instagram. And with us being fairly new to the DFW, I knew that I was going to be able to find somebody because there are so many businesses out there on Instagram. But she really stood out to us. And so when it came time to reaching out to a realtor for our own home hunt, I reached out to her simply by following her through the Dallas real estate hashtag. So consider that on your own job search as well, just following your city real estate hashtag and see which realtors are very active on Instagram or on social media in general for your area and you might find your perfect realtor. But um, our first call with her, we address some of the main focuses that the first part of our home search happened to revolve around. So that had to do with setting a goal for our mortgage monthly payment, understanding and optimizing our credit scores, and then also establishing what neighborhoods we wanted to move to and the type of home so that we can narrow down our search. We first started off by tightening up our finances, which was the first part of the list I just gave you. Nick and I enrolled in a credit repair program to make our application more appealing for a great mortgage rate. And we happened to get a good mortgage rate anyway. And I believe that just had to do with the economy and COVID. It just so happened to be good timing for us. But we did not try to time the market. It was good timing for us. And Nick only completed one round of disputes with the credit repair company, um, but I completed a few. So typically a credit repair company assists you with submitting your dispute letters in order to remove negative things on your credit report. Those include inquiries, missed payments, collections, charge offs, things like that. And it wasn't the best process for us. I basically felt like We didn't get the best customer service. They weren't super responsive and not even effective like to see a big change in our credit scores or a big enough change for it to really affect our loan application. Um, And I'm still unsure if I even want to continue with them because I'm actually still enrolled with them because the process does take so long with them sending in the dispute letters and then waiting on the credit re- bureaus to respond and then um, just starting over from there. It's kind of nuts. But in the end, we did receive that good interest rate I mentioned, so it didn't really matter. And I just reiterate from what I said last week, a credit repair service can be helpful if you use the right company. But for us, the company we went to 
was kind of a waste of money for the promises we got. So all of this is simply leading up to our home purchase. We hadn't even submitted the loan application at this point, but I just wanted to show this is what all went into the process. And we were fine with starting this early because our rental lease was set to expire at the beginning of September. So we had a lot of months to figure things out and that's exactly what we wanted. Enough lead time to prepare in different areas to save in order to make sure that we got the home that we wanted in a good time frame around the time that we were going to end our lease. So at the same time, we started with the credit repair, which I consider more so credit optimizing, but whatever. Um, we started to crunch a lot of numbers. So Nick and I are big on setting budget spreadsheets and adjusting numbers within that until we feel comfortable with where we landed. So we had somewhat of a template and then just watched swatch <laughs> why am I talking about swatches I think because we were painting the room <laughs> but we swapped out the numbers in order to get an idea of like what our home payments would be like with a particular home that we were looking at at that time so I think this was most of June we actually spent a lot of time looking at homes and then inputting the prices that they were listed at into a mortgage calculator and then estimating our costs to see if it would be a good fit. And we just kind of continued that process with those homes. We really liked a lot of homes that we saw early on, but we didn't actually tour them. So this whole first part of our process was kind of getting used to the market, understanding the neighborhoods, and adjusting our budget accordingly. Also during June, we found a lot of value in just learning those neighborhoods to determine if we could see ourselves living there. So most of the weekends consisted of us just driving around to look at places that we saw for sale and then also looking at the nearby retailers to see if there are stores, you know, that we frequently would go to and knowing that they were close or not to the places that we were considering to live. So that was actually a lot of fun because we got excited about where we would possibly live during these trips. And condos are actually our favorite places of view uh, because we saw them as great starter homes. Knowing that we wouldn't stay in our first home forever, we wanted something that was manageable and the industrial style loft kind of really spoke to us. It drew us in. So we self-toured a lot of condos and that was simply by driving by, looking at the curb appeal and then looking at the neighborhood as well. But I wish we actually looked at more neighborhoods than we did in the early stages because we ultimately chose a home. We chose a single family home instead of a condo. And then we ended up in a neighborhood that we didn't even tour before we actually saw the houses. So I would advise to just keep your options open from the get go because you never know where you'll end up settling. But if you do have like detailed enough criteria that you really want to stick to, then you'll be able to kind of keep your options narrow for your neighborhoods. But just know that the home that's available at the time you're looking that also matches your criteria may not be out there. And you might need to take a little bit more time until a home is listed that you fall in love with. So towards the end of June, we were a bit nervous, actually, about finding the right place in time. And this is still all before completing our loan application, but we just really got into our heads, I guess. So at the time, I didn't even know that the closing only took 30 days. Although I was familiar with the steps that went into a home close through my real estate education, I didn't have a real understanding of the process myself. So we started to get nervous and considered renting again. One day, Nick came across a dream home in the neighborhood that we were already looking at, and it was a rental. So we somehow convinced our agent to let us tour the home. Thankfully, it was not what we expected. The pictures made the home seem a lot more appealing, and the local stores that we frequented were a longer drive than what we wanted. So we decided not to pursue the rental home and just kept with our home search to buy. But again, that wasted some of our time and we should have just stayed the course from the beginning because we were already taking all the steps that we should have been taking. So I think by July, 
I started to get antsy and wanted to view actual homes. So we realized we were kind of in a good place. Um, there were some really nice homes and condos on the market that we were noticing were disappearing after days. And so we were confident with where we were with our savings and everything. So we finally decided that we were going to talk to a lender and prep ourselves for the loan application. So when we were ready to put in an offer on a home, we would have all our ducks in a row for that moment. So you can't officially tour a home until you have, at the very least, a pre-qualification from the lender. So we started to wrap things up with the credit repair company and submitted our loan application. Just keep in mind that if you have any open disputes with the credit bureaus, which is what we were conducting with the credit repair company, you can't do a loan application. They don't want to, they as in the lenders, don't want to review any loan applications that have open disputes on your credit reports. So we had to get that over with. And for the loan application, it was long. We came home one day after working, just completed it so we could start our tours. And they asked for everything. They asked for details on your current job, your past jobs, your home address, your past home addresses, uh, your bank account information, investment info, 401ks, credit cards, car loans, your current mortgage, if you already are a homeowner, and more, I'm sure that I'm forgetting. And they asked all of this to get a snapshot of your financial standing. So all of this information helps inform their decision on the total loan amount that they will give you, which helps inform the sell amount of the home that you should be looking for. And then also it helps determine what your monthly mortgage payments will be. And they kind of determine that based off of how much you're getting every month through your pay and then how much your expenses are. And these numbers vary as far as like the ratios that they compare depending on the type of loan that you get as well. And you'll just learn that with your loan officer, they should be educating you on what these different things are. So you submit all this information on the loan application and throughout the closing process, they're going to ask for the receipts. They're going to want to see your bank statements, your check stubs, all that information to back up the information you initially gave them on the loan application. So once the loan application is complete, you'll receive what's called a loan estimate. And this is something that the lender should go through with you to make sure that you understand everything. It'll tell you how much you can afford on your home. So that's the sales price, like I mentioned earlier, that you'll be looking for on the listings. And it also estimates the monthly payments and additional fees you'll have, particularly at closing. And these really add up, so it's important to make note of these and to ask any questions that you have of your loan officer. Now, our particular process was very informal. We received a phone call from the loan officer who said, this is the price range of the homes you should be looking at, and this is the expected mortgage payment you'll have. And that was it. I was looking for a little bit more explanation, and I knew at some point we needed to have that loan estimate sent to us. But I just blamed COVID because we didn't have any in-person meetings with our lender. It was all phone and email communications. But I still deep down think that we should have received a little bit more education from him. But hey, we have no control over the process we had. And in the end, we got the home that we wanted with, I think, an interest rate and other terms that we really deserved. But eventually... We did have to ask for the actual loan estimate so that we could review those associated fees because that is money that you need to have on hand and ready by the time you close. So I must say that I was happy to be a bit knowledgeable in real estate to even ask for this because we would have just been strung along with the brief instructions here and there, but not a full understanding of the process, which is what I normally would expect and want. So the estimate... It's kind of what I call the clear to shop. When I tell you we went crazy, we were setting up three plus home tours per evening with our agent. They weren't all close to each other either. So it was quite a bit of driving throughout the DFW in just three to four hours. She kind of had to force us to pump the brakes when she saw that we had no strategy when it came to the neighborhoods. 
We simply had a home style that we wanted and were willing to live anywhere in the DFW to get that. As long as we had the stores that we shop at nearby and the neighborhood just gave us the feeling of it being home for us. So that was a hectic two to three weeks, but we did slowly but surely narrow down our search to areas where the homes were really nice and we were really noticing that we liked them and the price point. I think for a full work week though, we weren't home and we had to get food from restaurants for dinner every single night. And I did not love it, but it was something that we had to do in the short term because we were on this mission in the short timeline. So we got it done. And like I said, this was like mid to late July. So we finally found the perfect home at the end of July. And I did take a bit of convincing, I must admit, after viewing the home once more, I agreed that it had great potential, definitely all the space we needed. So we put an offer in. We learned that there was another offer already on the table. So we raised ours and then won against those other people who put theirs in about a day before us. So lucky for us, no additional negotiations were needed as far as the price. Our first offer was accepted, which is rare for the DFW, but we were so blessed for that to happen because we had enough time to still be able to close in September, which was our goal. So we did celebrate, of course, because our offer was accepted, but we knew this wasn't the finish line and there was much work to be done after this very, very momentous occasion. appreciated our buyer's agent because she shared information with us that I didn't even think to ask. So when you put in a home offer to a pre-owned home, the seller has to provide what's called a seller's disclosure. The seller's disclosure basically states facts about the house and the working condition of major items such as the AC, doors, windows, appliances, basically anything you expect to be working and expect to be present or not present like mold and roof damage and things like that. So they have to say all these things that they are aware of so that we know of any potential red flags. So not only did we receive this form, which is mandatory, and we had minimal concerns, we also got an email with details on the average utility bills they have for the home. So this was super helpful. Coming from a renting mindset, we were so used to all of our utilities being lumped together into our monthly rent payments. This was kind of a wake-up call for me because I particularly pay the utility bills while Nick focuses on the rent, now mortgage payments. So with this information, we of course went back to the drawing board and added these numbers to our budget to make sure that we could still afford a comfortable budget with this home. I'd be lying if I said it was fully comfortable, but I think the stretch in our budget is causing us to be smarter with our money and even more goal-oriented with chasing after raises and promotions at our job to make the breathing room a little bit broader within our budget. I wouldn't say that we're living above our means either, though. I think it's important to keep in mind while moving towards closing for a home that you don't want to make any bad decisions just because you're already in the process of doing this, it isn't going to make home owning enjoyable. It's going to make it more stressful. So keep that in mind. And thankfully, I don't think we were in that position. But if that's the case for you, just keep renting until you're comfortable with making that jump. The time is going to come where you can make that decision and you shouldn't rush into anything, especially like this, because it's really hard to get out of. But it was helpful um, that our agent added that piece in for us to add that to our budget and it was also helpful that she kind of added some pieces into the contract that protected us once we submitted our offer so we paid what's called an option fee and it was a really low fee that basically put the home on hold for us while we reviewed the seller's disclosure and our inspection was completed so the inspection was completed early august so a lot of these things start to be a very quicker timeline back to back because 
A lot had to be done in a short period of time, but it's kind of like once the offer ex- is accepted, a trigger is basically hit that basically um, encourages us to do a bunch of stuff real quick so that we can get it all done before closing. But come early August, we were able to have our inspection done and our option period was only one week. So we had to have that done pretty quickly. And within that week, we reviewed the inspection and disclosure to ensure that there were no red flags at the home. And if potential repairs seemed to be manageable, we were confident in moving forward in the process. So thankfully, our inspection um, only had like small issues that we could easily repair, but there were no red flags that were in the inspection or disclosure to say like, hey, you probably don't want to buy this home because this major thing is wrong. So we then went like full force with our offer and submitted our earnest money. Earnest money is the first part of your down payment, which shows to the seller that you're serious about the home purchase. So it's what they call in the industry having skin in the game. So at that time, we sent our money to what is called the escrow or title company. Those who facilitate the home closing or the transfer ownership, they held the money until closing day. And this was mid-August. So this kicks off the closing period that I mentioned earlier, which is typically a 30-day process. Unfortunately, we ended up having to push back our move-out date at the rental and pay additional rent because our lease was set to end at the beginning of September. But I say it was worth it to find a perfect home and just make sure that everything was completed in a proper timeline and not being rushed and then putting us in a bad situation. So typically after the earnest money is sent, there are steps that the buyers and sellers have to take before the actual closing meeting on the home. So as the buyers, we had to provide any additional documentation that the lender needed to approve our home loan. And then the sellers have to complete any repairs that we agreed on. Sometimes there are additional contingencies, but We were super simple just having the repairs and getting the loan approval. With the sellers having already moved out, we did not have the option to ask them to make repairs because they weren't actually in town to complete them. So we agreed to receive a credit towards our closing costs to make up for that inconvenience. I would have preferred moving into a more move-in ready home with the repairs done for us, but that wasn't the case, but we made it work. So it's whatever. For about three weeks after that, we didn't have too many action items to complete. It was a waiting game. So we made the most of our time by looking up our drives to work and back home. Um, What the drives look like going to our nearby stores that we frequent, getting to know the neighborhood, scouting out our new favorite Uh, restaurants because we love using DoorDash and discussing and prioritizing our own repairs and upgrades that we wanted to do and then of course my favorite planning out our furniture layout and decor plans. Nick did have some paperwork to provide the loan officer and we also completed a virtual first-time homeowners course. This was super helpful because it provided Nick with the foundation in new home ownership that I basically received from my licensed education. I think we were supposed to take this course sooner, but this was another piece from our lender where I think he dropped the ball, but we didn't know to ask about it either. So um, some other things that took up our time during this period was paying for the appraisal, which is the home valuation done by a independent professional. They send that information to the lender and the lender uses that for the loan. Uh, We also had to shop for homeowners insurance quotes. So I was contacted by someone who represented the lender, someone affiliated with our agent. And then I also did some online quotes and we ended up going obviously with the lowest and best coverage that we could find and saved a bit of money on our auto insurance as well by bundling the two. And the way homeowners insurance works, you pay a full year's worth of coverage up front at closing. So that is like rolled into your closing costs. And I think it actually is itemized throughout the monthly payments that you pay on your mortgage. 
And then we also shopped around for best rates on our utilities, like internet, electricity, gas, security, um, and things of that nature. Something that's new to me that's not in Wisconsin is that electricity is deregulated, meaning that there isn't just one provider for electricity. You can go to many different companies and try to get the best rate for your electricity. So that was like a whole ordeal that I can talk about on a later episode or not. It may not matter to you. But that was something that I definitely had to keep in mind. And I was kind of squeezing all of that research in and stuff within a two week time frame. So the beginning of September was mostly consumed by utility setup for me. While Nick worked mainly on the required lender items, I focused on getting things set up for our home so that it was moving ready. This was a time where I was very fortunate to be working from home because I had to take so many calls throughout the entire workday just to get this stuff set up. And although online chats were really helpful, some of the setup stuff, they required you to call in. So I had to do that a lot of times in the middle of my workday just to make sure this stuff was lined up properly. Now, I mentioned that sneaky additional costs pop up with the home closing fees, but there's also utility setup, transfer, and whatever other fees they can think of that come up too. So keep that in mind as well for your home buying purchase. I was in charge of switching and setting up our home security system, electricity, water, gas, pest control, internet, probably more things that I can't remember, but it just felt like a lot. And our agent and inspector both sent us contacts of people to work with that assisted with setting up those services for your new home, but they weren't super responsive or as hands-on as I would have wanted them to be, seeing that they were called concierges. But I took the matters into my own hands and I just got it done. It happened to be a headache, but thankfully I had about two weeks to get things squared away. This consisted of all those calls and I had to, you know, set up services, switch service, set up dates where they would install and just confirm those dates and set up billing information and getting all the information that I needed from them for charges moving forward, just so that I had an understanding of how everything would be set up. And it was just too much. But at the end, I was really proud of myself because we got it all done and I knew it was going to be done right because I did it. So we also spent the beginning of September, and this is probably like the first week or two of the month, preparing for the move. So I know most people do their own packing and get friends and family to help with the move, but we worked into our moving budget, a packing budget as well. So we hired movers to pack and move our entire apartment. Keep in mind, we lived on the third floor in hot Texas with no elevator. And we did not want to put anybody through the pain of carrying all that stuff down three flights of stairs for us. So we figured we just hire people who can do it professionally and they can't complain because we're paying them. So it was kind of costly, but the idea of packing all that stuff just turned us off and especially moving it all. So when it came to moving day, we just kicked up our feet, hung out outside, which happened to be a gorgeous day. I think in like the 60s or 70s, which is like perfect weather in the Midwest where we're from. But the professionals took care of it. And that money could have been put towards other things, I know for sure. But it was just something else that gave us peace of mind. We also wanted peace of mind when it came to cleaning both of our places. So we were fortunate to receive referrals from our inspector. And we found our professional cleaning service through him too. So we hired this local family service to clean our new home before moving in and our old apartment before the move out inspection. So they were great. They did great work and made the process less stressful. So with our closing date being on a Friday, we will see what's called our closing disclosure or also known as the closing statement settlement statement from the lender on the Wednesday before our closing. So this was like partway through the month. Our closing was on Friday the 18th. So this closing disclosure that we received is a final review of all the fees that we had to pay at closing. And it had the exact amount of money that we needed to bring to the title company on closing date for 
the fees that we had to pay that day. Keep in mind, it was not the first month's mortgage, just the fees associated with closing. So when you receive this form, you know that things are real. It's like real, real, super official. We in there like swimwear, (laughs) as they say. But this document also outlines whether you need to bring a cashier's check or a personal check, which are things that we don't normally just have on hand. So that's something to keep in mind because you want to secure that ASAP before you even head to closing on that last day. So I use this crucial step kind of as like a point in my timeline to finalize all the utilities. I knew once we got that closing disclosure, like there was no turning back. The lenders wasn't going to renege on the loan. The sellers couldn't back out. So I felt that it was final enough for me to truly set up all of those utilities that I did so much research and stuff on. I finally pulled the trigger basically on those services. Sometimes buyers, you know, just aren't able to close on their home for whatever reason and the lender is unable to approve their loan. So I didn't want to jinx that process for us. So I held off on doing quite a bit, which pushed some work off to the last minute. But I just wanted to stay organized and and I have to redo any work and just knock all that stuff out when I knew it was for certain. So once we got that final statement, like I said, I used it as like a trigger um, when we got that clear to close. So I set up new services like water with the city, um, our natural gas, home security installation and pest control. Uh, I switched over our internet, electricity and mail service. You can use the post office to have all your mail forwarded. So you don't have to worry about updating your address right away with all the organizations you're associated with to get that mail. Just set up that mail forwarding and then you can update your address with other organizations directly within the next year. I think they give you a year to have your mail forwarded before they stop doing that. And we only updated our addresses with our banks and employers right away to make sure that that information was coming to the correct address, especially with some debit cards expiring soon (laughs) that we needed to come to our new address. I also want to point out during that 30-day period when you're closing on your home, you want to be very mindful that your offer has been accepted, but your loan has not been funded yet. So do not edit your credit. This can jeopardize your ability to get your home loan. That means no major spending on your credit card, no inquiries, no new cars, no nothing, no balling out on the credit. Your credit activity needs to be dormant until you finally close and get the keys to your new home. So we finally made it to the last section, which is closing and the post-close. So our closing process was actually pretty rocky because there was such a big need for homes in the DFW. There was literally not enough workers at our lender to handle all of the home closings. So although we got our closing statement, we never got the official clear to close. Thankfully, Nick had open communication with our lender. He could easily text, call, and email him for updates. So he was able to ask for those regular updates literally on the day we should have been closing. So at about 3 p.m. on our closing date, our loan officer gave us an updated amount due at closing. And we had to, like, all of a sudden scramble to make sure that we had the right amount to pay. And then we had to even... (laughs) like not paying it at the closing table but because it wasn't a lot of money like it was fine it was just crazy but it wasn't until 4 48 p.m and this place was set to close at 5 p.m on a friday that we finally closed and by the grace of god we were able to do that it didn't have to push any of our plans back that we had set contingent on closing on friday in a perfect world we would have had a pre-planned appointment on that friday And no additional changes to our closing fees. So we would have already had our personal check or cashier's check with the amount that we needed to pay at the closing table. And it just would have gone a lot smoother. We would have had our agent there. She was there earlier in the day just waiting for when we got approval to come in and close. And she had to leave by the time we even arrived because we were just getting different information 
from our lenders. So that whole communication bit was very confusing, but we survived the process. And that's all I have to say about that. Just make sure that you have a lender who you trust and you can reach out to for information at any time so that there's no confusion. Our agent was on her stuff, but it was nothing that she could do at that point, except, you know, just wait just like we could. So it was definitely a nerve wracking situation, but we had no control over the delay with the lender and their staff's availability. So we just kind of had to go with it and it thankfully worked out. Uh, So once we actually moved in, the work still didn't stop. I think for like two weeks and honestly, there's still some stuff I need to follow up on. I had to meet with so many technicians and professionals to fix and install things. So remember not to fully settle in when you first move into your house because there will still be a lot of moving parts. Now, even a month into living here, we are hoping to get the final boxes unpacked. I know, I know, they're still not all unpacked, Um, but we will get that done and finally get well acquainted with our neighborhood and all of that great stuff. And I think after this, we'll be able to have some more fun with decorating and upgrading furniture and adjusting to our new budget even as well. And as you know, I love talking about money management, financial goals, budgeting systems, all of that great stuff. So next episode, I'll actually discuss how we budget our finances now as a married codependent couple who are also new homeowners. So I know we had a past episode about the finances that had to do with our home buying process, but I want to talk about post move, like what is it really like? And how do we adjust and plan for it? So I hope you've been enjoying the content that I've given you so far. And I hope you enjoyed the next few episodes that we'll have in this series about buying a home and particularly being a first time homeowner. It has been a lot of fun for me to share our own experience with you all. And I really hope that, like I said, you're getting something out of it. Don't forget to subscribe and review the podcast. Your following and feedback keeps me going. It literally gives me podcast life. All right, y'all. So for more from Be Chic as well, you can check out my blog 24-7 at bechicu.org and follow me on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter at the Be Chic. That is T-H-E-B-C-H-I-C. Thanks again for tuning in and we'll talk again next week.